Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to Democracy in America and at the virtual NHFPL. My name is Luis Chavez Pramel, and I am the Deputy Director of the New Haven Free Public Library. Thank you all for joining us this evening for a great conversation between Professors Matthew Fry Jacobson and Philip Atiba Goff on the Third Reconstruction. If you have a moment, feel free to check out the New Haven Free Public Library's Chromebooks or Wi Fi hotspots so you could watch Professor Goff's wonderful TED Talk. So without any further ado, I will leave it to Professor Matthew Fry Jacobs. Thank you so much, Luis. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, a special thanks to our partners at the New Haven Free Public Library, especially uh, Marianne Huggins, Isaac Shubb, Seth Godfrey, and Luis Chavez Grumel. Um, thank you to my colleague in Public Humanities, Karen Rothman, who does so much for the series, and also for our associate Svogato Chakraborty, who is working even now as we speak behind the scenes. Um, one program note, Tuesday, March 30th uh, at 7 o'clock, um, urban studies scholar Elihu Rubin and myself will be in conversation with author Joan Cavanaugh and oral historian Dorothy Johnson on their work, Our Community at Winchester, a study of union organizing efforts and worker solidarity at the Winchester Gun Factory here in New Haven, a very important chapter in, in labor history and in local, local New Haven history. So please join us for that. Tonight, it is my pleasure to welcome Phil Atiba Goff. Uh, Phil Goff took his PhD in psychology from Stanford and he taught at UCLA and the John Jay College of Criminal Justice before joining the faculty at Yale, where he is professor of African American studies and psychology. He's authored or co authored many, many scholarly articles, including The Threat of Appearing Racist, Risky Situations Sources of Racial Disparity in Police Behavior. Measuring Racial Disparities in Police Use of Force, Body Cams and Gender Equity, and Protecting Whiteness on How White Racial Representation Reduces the Chances of Police Use of Force, and literally scores of other articles. Goff became a national leader in the science of racial bias by pioneering experiments that exposed how our minds learn to associate blackness and crime implicitly, often with deadly consequences. This research led Dr. Goff to co-found the Center for Policing Equity at UCLA, which grew to be the largest research and action think tank on race and policing in the world, host to the, also the world's largest collection of police behavioral data in the National Science Foundation funded National Justice Database, a tool to reduce inequitable policing through scientific analysis. He regularly appears on cable news. It is a frequent experience of mine and maybe yours that um, I will leave a faculty meeting um, and an hour later I'll turn on my TV and there he is. He was a witness for President Obama's task force on 21st century policing and has presented before members of Congress and congressional panels, Senate press briefings and White House advisory councils. And tonight he's here at the library with us for a very special Thursday evening edition of Tuesday at the libraries. Uh, welcome Phil Goff, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much, Matt. So I have, you know, so many questions, and I know you wanted to talk about the the third U.S. Reconstruction, and it, which is an enormous kind of advocacy project. Um, but I have a few things I want to do before we get to that piece. Um, and the first has to do with just your disciplinary background. Um, psychology um, is not particularly well known as a discipline that is at the front edge of, of you know, racial justice issues, let's put it that way. Um, so can you just talk a little bit about how either how the discipline of psychology brought you to criminal justice issues or the other way around, how criminal justice concerns brought you to the discipline of psychology, whichever way that story went. Yeah, so it's, I don't usually get a chance to talk about this. And so I feel like, oh, good, time to go ahead and spill some tea. Um, uh, I think that psychology like anthropology has a lot to reckon with in its history and anthropology has done a better job because some of its uh, sort of more uh, well-known wrongs in the space of racial justice um, were so front and center egregious. But psychology as a discipline gave us intelligence testing, which also gave us the SATs and all the economic, uh, economic and educational inequality that comes from it. Um, and psychology is responsible for this idea that I literally get paid to tell you what you think, 
when you think about that as a gig, it's a great gig. Oh my, it's amazing. <laughs> um, but as a disciplinary background, it's been lying about what's inside the hearts and minds of people and the ways in which that shapes our world. And in fact, it part of the, the, the quintessential lie is that our hearts and minds are the origins of the shaping of our world. So I got into psychology because I had basically taken all the other social sciences and my mentors as an undergraduate were like, you talk as if the world is happening in people's minds and that's what we need to manage. We need to manage sort of the Stuart Hall notion of ideology. Um, so you should go and take at least a couple of courses before you come back and get an interdisciplinary degree. So I went, I planned to go get a master's degree in psychology. I went to study with the, at the time, what I thought was the most famous um, black academic. I didn't have the pleasure of, of engaging as an undergraduate. So I, I, <clears throat> I, I did African-American studies as an undergrad and just was spoiled rotten with uh, mentorship. And what happened was I fell in love with the disciplinary training of experimentation because I realized as I became more and more of a quantitative social scientist that the ability to say X causes Y was the whole game for white people in social science. That if you could do that in a convincing way, if that was the story you were telling, um, uh, then you win. And social psychology, more so than anything other than maybe cognitive psychology, is very narrow, very specific, cuts nature at the joints and says, I'm going to randomly control, right? Randomizing control one variable in a laboratory so pristinely that I, I make my, uh, my research assistants wear white gloves. And that then produces a causal story that is almost unassailable if you do it the right way. And even economists who sit on high thinking about, well, our math is hardest and therefore we know best among the social sciences, they have a kind of envy for the ways in which we make nature come to us in the laboratory. So once I recognized that within the space of quantitative social science, that social psychology had a set of tools that were you know, second to none, I stayed to see if whether or not I could master those tools in the service of the things that I cared about. The problem then became that social psychology makes problems small enough to fit into a laboratory. So I then got stuck inside of that space. And what happens is as soon as I finish graduate school, I, I immediately meet this uh, woman who, uh, who said terrible things about me um, uh, and challenged me immediately, challenged my manhood and challenged me immediately to do this kind of work out of the lab. And so I was, as soon as I had finished my training, liberated to go out into the world and figure out how to basically invent or reinvent a social psychology that was based in field studies. And that allowed me to basically be a sociologist and political scientist with a social psychological background, right? Uh, just a series of very happy accidents where I got particular disciplinary training that made me a methodologist of a certain type. And then I got personal challenges that made me sort of a, a deep expert, uh, sort of a subject matter expert in a different way. No, nothing other than those set of accidents, no disciplinary incentives, no, you know, no, no, uh, training process, no group of scholars, no cohort, just a bunch of happy accidents led me to a place that psychologists don't tend to go. You're quite right. Well, so that gave you, it gave you a laboratory. It gave you the world as laboratory. Um, in a world where most people are condemned to either observe racism or suffer it, um, you got to run experiments and figure it out. Can you talk a little bit about some of the experiments you've run and how, how you um, how you came to the knowledge that you have about about how how racism works and especially how it works in the criminal justice system. Sure. So the, the biggest sort of mind blowing moment for me, I, I'd taken no courses as, in psychology as an undergrad. I just showed up to grad school in it. Um, uh, the admissions committee made a terrible, terrible mistake, but I was there and it was too late. And the thing that that I mean, it just it was mind blowing. I showed up and they said attitudes just don't matter. Attitudes are 10% of behavior at best. I thought I was studying white racial attitudes and white ideology. And they're like, that's cute. That's 10% of the game. And if you really want to understand people, you have to understand how situations fundamentally shape behaviors, and literally very local situations. It's a little bit more macro that matters, but it only matters in the way that it shapes the local. And I was like, really? That's, is, are you serious? And I had a bunch of failed experiments because I thought I knew better in the first and second year graduate program. My very kind, generous mentor said, maybe try this stuff over here. That was the stuff that ended up working and becoming the dissertation. Um, and I became convinced that ideology was less real than identity and that situations that tweaked identity would be really big motivators in changing behavior. And then fast forward to that woman who 
said terrible things about me. She, her name being Tracy Cassie, gets me into um, a facility where I get to do experiments on officers. And what I had seen in doing ride-alongs and engaging with them, um, one of the things I'd seen is that the masculinity threat for men who were officers was so great, particularly when they encountered Black men. And that that threat to manhood would be a huge predictor of racial disparities, even though it wasn't explicitly racialized, right? So officers that are very, very concerned about their manhood are going to end up with more racially disparate outcomes. And the reason I, I told the first part of the story is to tell this. We set up an experiment where we tested how insecure uh, officers were on their manhood. And the idea was the ones who were most insecure would see the biggest racial disparities. And as we were running it, I thought, oh, shoot, I'm full of BS. This is none of this is going to work. Racist, bigoted officers are going to do bigoted things. And all of this fancy book learning that I've done in the laboratory just doesn't matter in the world. I, I remember that, that really sinking feeling in my gut that all of this stuff that I said, well, I think social psychology can help. I think experiments could be useful. I thought all that's gonna be BS. I went home that night, I looked at the first um, uh, poll of data and I was wrong about being wrong. Prejudice predicted nothing. And the masculinity threat was a huge, huge predictor of racial disparities. And I thought, oh, all that stuff we did in the laboratory, I guess it actually mattered out in the world. And that working backwards, the disparity is the problem. And we can really treat as we can be agnostic about the cause because the system is the problem. That's the thing that I keep with me from my disciplinary training. And that has allowed me to look at those things like masculinity threat being a problem, uh, the automatic association between black people and monkeys being a predictor of abuse towards black children within law enforcement. Those sorts of things come out of a, of a disciplinary training and the literature in social psychology. And I think they help to expand the way that sociologists and political scientists have traditionally approached this issue of, of criminal legal systems, particularly on the side of public safety. Um, so many questions. Well, so one is, um, what is the intervention that is suggested by that kind of experiment? So in one of the cities where we worked, um, it, it apparently you get to top three choices um, after you leave the, the police academy, you're likely to get put into one of those. And when we looked across the city, we couldn't really see a pattern. So everybody wanted to work downtown because downtown's where all the restaurants are and they give free meals to cops, right? So not super, particularly useful. But if you take the people who scored highest on the need to demonstrate their manhood, they always want their top three all of them are the three black neighborhoods in the city. And so all of a sudden you have the folks who are most eager to prove their manhood are all wanting to go to the places where black people are. And that is a ecology of contested masculinity that's just no, like, why would you want that? It's like getting the, the worst people from the bar well, drunk, it's, right, it's together. The, it's the absolute opposite of, of community policing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and like it, even worse, it's like an experiment for getting the worst kind of effect. So the intervention there is simply randomize it. Don't let people choose where they go. Now, you can't say you walk into a city and be like, I see racial disparities here. You need to randomize your patrol assignments. Like that's not a thing that comes naturally with a, with a, a lens understanding the long history of racism. But when you understand that masculinity threats one of the mechanisms, you have an intervention that seems anodyne. But when they did it, they cut the racial disparities in use of force by 40%, hmm. right? <laughs> so, okay, racism takes lots of different forms and it, it finds different paths to get there. It's not that somehow that's a truer version of what's happening, but it's a, it's a nice way to find an intervention that people don't have to be up in arms about. Right, right. Okay, that's excellent. So um, so we've, we've spent five minutes in your discipline, um, I'm going to make you spend five minutes in mine. <laughs> I'm a historian, and I, I can't think about these questions outside of the long, 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 deep historical context. So, um, for those who who might not be familiar, I'm going to instead of narrating it forwards, I'm actually going to excavate it backwards. But just thinking about kind of where we sit historically. So, 
for for young people of all backgrounds, um, for white people who've never maybe been involved in these issues before, I think there's there's a pretty strong feeling that the the kind of the post George Floyd murder, the post Breonna Breonna Taylor murder is is like it's a period kind of unto itself. It's a it's a it's a new kind of moment in American political life. Going back a little further, there's the Ferguson, the, the Michael Brown murder, and the uprising in Ferguson, and the emergence of BLM. Going back a little further, there's that period in the aughts that you might call the period of cell phone witness, where suddenly like the police misbehavior was, was being filmed and it was showing up and going viral in, in ways that were absolutely new. Um, the period that maybe inaugurated that, although it wasn't a cell phone, it was videotape, was the Rodney King beating in, in Los Angeles, which was a very new thing. It was like, can, oh, so this is this is what African American people have been talking about for decades, right? Now, now it's there on our TV screens to see. Um, before that, there's the decades and decades and decades of complaint uh, on the part of African Americans, especially, but people of color in general, uh, around police behavior and a neglect of the issue and major um, race riots uh, around this issue in Detroit and Harlem in 1943 and Watts in 1965. Before that. There's the Thirteenth Amendment, which which um, makes slavery unconstitutional, but creates an exception for for people convicted of a crime, and it, it creates a system. Some people call it slavery by another name. It creates a system whereby really vague laws like vagrancy and loitering can be used to round up people, usually African Americans, jail them, and then use the 13th Amendment to sell off their labor, basically as slave, as slave labor in, in convict labor, labor units who did, you know, making turpentine in Florida and, you know, blasting tunnels for railroads in Georgia and doing, working the cane fields in Louisiana, really slavery by another name. And then to go back even further, historian Robin Kelly, makes the argument in a really beautiful and powerful essay about the Trayvon Martin murder. Um, he says, Trayvon Martin um, couldn't evoke the stand your ground laws because Trayvon Martin by design did not have any ground to stand on. And that goes all the way back to Atlantic slavery and Southern colonialism, um, the, the period of European conquest where to be a citizen meant to be someone who could take up arms against Indians and against um, uh, slave uprisings. So we have these kind of concentric rings of historical reality. And I just wonder um, for someone who focuses so much on, on you know, the mind and on bias and on, on kind of um, mental reflex, how you think about that long history and how you kind of combine your insights as a psychologist with your insights as um, a black studies professor to kind of think about the interventions in this really long, long history. Yeah, and so the, the, the frame for social psychology um, is the influence of real or imagined others on thought and behavior. And so it literally is the intersection of individual within situation and context. Um, and since the 1950s, when Leon Festinger realized that you didn't need to go and study doomsday cults and take it all the time that you need to do to do that, um, you could just give people a bunch of sheets of paper, get them to, to answer things, and then you would have a paper. Psychology has become more and more focused on the lab and just the mind as if it can possibly exist out of context. But the origins of social psychology are social. Right. I mean, when you think about the great uh, original, like when you think about Milgram and when you think about like the uh, with all the problems, with, uh, wrong, all the things wrong with it, the Stanford prison experiment. For people who don't know that, can you just give us the quick thumbnail sketch of that experiment? Yeah. I was just about to go into both of those. Right. Um, th those are, are sort of pinnacle. They're they're you know, tent, tent poles in what we call modern social psychology. And they were so real. So for Milgram, what's happening is Stanley Milgram is seeing what has happened. Um, in uh, World War II, particularly the, the, the Holocaust of Jews in, in uh, Nazi Germany and says, how could people do this? And he has a theory, not about um, the economic forces of Germany, um, not about the, the mythologies of German empire, but about the character of German people. He says, these are rule followers. These are people who obey authority, not like Americans. Like Americans, we, we're rebels, like we're James Dean people. 
1961, you have you know, uh, some of the, the, the trials um, uh, post-World War II, and he said, I'm gonna do experiments. And his thought is that if you have somebody in a lab coat who says, you must continue, you must go forward and do this thing, Americans, we're not gonna, folks from the US, we're not gonna uh, comply, it'll be the Germans. And so he has a really complex, deep theater exercise where he brings in three people, two of them are accomplices, right? One is a learner and one is the experiment. Experiments are white lab coat. And the learner, randomly assigned, but it's always the Confederate, the learner gets shocks every time they get a question wrong. And the test participant is the person who has to deliver the shocks. So every time they get something wrong, you shock them. And each, for each next wrong thing, you shock them more and more and more and more. Now, in one of the conditions, one version of this study, the learner, so the, an actor, is in a separate room. And after a certain number of shocks, every shock he screams. And after a certain number of shocks, he says, I have a heart condition. You can't keep doing this to me. Right? You have no right to keep me here. Bang it on the wall. Let me out. Let me out. And everybody says, oh, wait, I should stop, right? And the experimenter in the white lab coat says, you must continue. The experiment must continue. Almost everyone from the United States shocks the person until they would have been dead. That is the power of authority in those kinds of situations. Okay. Never got to do an experiment, the, the experimental condition with, with German participants, because realize this is a human thing. But that's a hard, that's a, a complex study to put. You got to put together the box. You got to get an exper a, a Confederate who screams at the right time and like is convincingly got a heart condition. There's a lot of things going on there. Similarly, the Stanford Prison Experiment, a bunch of Stanford undergraduates, and it's, there's tremendous controversy around it now. So I, I won't go into the depths of all of that. But the idea behind it is, some are assigned to be guards, some are assigned to be prisoners, and you see pretty grotesque, abusive behavior inside of just a couple of days where everybody could have just said, I wanna be let out, but they were so in that moment, right? They're banging on the doors, like they're, they're worried about hurting themselves, they're crying, they're being starved, they're being, you know, like there's urine and, and it's, it's real, real bad. And these were Stanford undergraduates who were picked to be average for Stanford undergraduates. So the power of the role is almost determinative. That's the roots of social psychology. And we just don't do that very much now because it's hard to publish papers when that takes like a whole year of your life to, to set up and, and manage, you don't get as many papers as, as you do if I give a bunch of undergraduates three sheets of paper. So you asked me about sort of how I, I, I think about as a psychologist, the, the concentric roles uh, or the concentric circles of oppression as represented by violence purveying um, members of the state. I'd say that's the situation. The situation we find ourselves in is overdetermined by that historical momentum. And psychology as a discipline needs to reckon better with history in order for us to be more vital in this space of racial justice. Because racial race as a context doesn't make sense outside of history. So, so that, that's how I engage with it. I'm just like, oh, I wanna be better as a psychologist. I gotta read people like Matthew Fry Jacobson. That's how that works. Well, one so I'm uh, last question before we really turn to the thing that you you told me <laughs> you wanted to talk about. Um, so, what's your advice for historians? Because I think that you know history as a discipline is just psychologically anemic. It just is. There's just there's just no question about that. And I think you know I'm a cultural historian. In cultural history, the 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 holy grail is that magical zone where the psyche meets like the broader structures or the broader kind of historical currents like that's that's what we're after and a lot of that you know people you mentioned Stuart Hall people like that who talk about ideology kind of do that work for us we're not very psychological as a group um, what's your advice to historians who want to to beef up that dimension of our work so I, I really feel like in the academy with curious folks, um, it is often the case that all scholars, that, that, that almost all scholars are interesting in inverse proportion to the number of scholars of the same discipline they deal with, right? Which is to say, like, I'm much more interesting as a person the less time I spend with other psychologists. And historians, I think, are gonna be more interesting the less time they spend with other historians, right? I think history is, is to some degree the exception because historians are interesting people who think interesting things, but, I, psychology has ideas about how we got here, how society got set up here, almost entirely 
based on sets of relationships we're able to observe in laboratories between individuals and computers or individuals and sheets of paper. That's an anemic understanding of how structures work. So if psychologists would just deal with sociologists, political scientists, and historians, I think we'd be much more interesting as a field. In the same way, when I talk to historians, frequently I hear things about the, the nature of how human beings interact or, or the causal relationship between psyche and behavior, which is completely untethered to anything that we know in science. Right? So that's fine. I mean, by the way, it happens even more in the law where, I mean, people are, the behavior is regulated and punished based on these lay understandings of how human psychology works. So, I mean, what I'd say is simply, if you've got a, a theory that's dependent on how psychology functions or how psychology and action are, are connected, check with the psychologist because we'll tell you whether or not that stuff is, is rooted in reality or just rooted in comic books, right, about it, just caricature of it in the same way that I think that psychologists need to be thinking about history, power, and structure and don't have the language for it because it's hard to fit into the lab. Right, right. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so now <laughs> the third, the third U.S. Reconstruction. That is, um, that is a broad concept. It is, um, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, I think we can all agree that it's needed. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean, what you mean by it, and kind of how how you would imagine it, both how you would envision it, but how you would imagine our getting there. So first, I, I gotta, I gotta cite my sources. The first time I ever heard about. Um, a call for a third reconstruction, I was listening to Tracy Mears. Um, and so in, in sort of expressing that to you, I should give, uh, give credit to her in the framing of that. Um, and it was funny to me because I hadn't been thinking about a second reconstruction because that's how much I wasn't reading historians the way I should have been. Um, <clears throat> so the idea is you have reconstruction post-emancipation, the idea that you have to reconstruct the nation um, uh, to create the conditions for full um, participation for the for the descendants of uh, formerly enslaved folks and for the living formerly enslaved folks. If we think about what we understand now as the civil rights movement as a second attempt at that, as a second reconstruction, um, that that like the first was essentially upended by political compromise and the weaponization of white fear, then that unfinished project needs to be that baton needs to be passed and taken up in our current moment. And you thought maybe that could happen post Ferguson. But as so often happens when you have sort of these watershed moments, it goes real hard left or hard right. And obviously it went hard right because um, we got two years um, post Ferguson where the, uh, the Obama era DOJ is really doing work that the Department of Justice had never done previously. The work that Vanita Gupta was doing in DOJ as a non-confirmed uh, head of civil rights, she was literally talking about the financial architecture of white supremacy in small villages and towns. The Ferguson report is a landmark report. I feel like we don't appreciate how, how much of a departure that was. And they got basically six months to figure out the right way to put it together before we were obviously entering into a, a period of democratic recession, which is cl clearly where we've been for the past four years. So the hope is in the wake of the public lynching of George Floyd, that that baton can be passed, that there can be an attempt to say, we need to stand up systems that rid the body politic of the toxins um, of structural racism and the way that we've had that in our policies um, and in our, in our norms since, it, since our, our founding as a nation. That project is to me echoed in some of the calls for prison and police abolition from the folks who've done their reading, right? Who understand that Angela Davis in, in Abolition Democracy is citing Du Bois. And that literally in, in the first work that uh, Davis puts out, which is an anthology when they come in the morning, she has Julian Bond write the foreword and Bond's entire foreword is about Du Bois, right? That in 1935 talking about black reconstruction which is where we make us free comes from, right? Cause nothing is new since Du Bois. Um, that, that that concept of, um, of abolition of democracy is a proactive concept. It is not about just getting rid of bad systems, but about proactively standing those up. We could be in a moment when that's possible. And you see, without the need to wrangle with bipartisanship, what's, what's possible in uh, uh, COVID relief efforts. And I, you wonder whether or not there might be other moments of deciding that principle should outweigh political expediency 
And we actually can start standing up those systems, maybe not federally, maybe not writ large, but state in a couple of states in city by city. The work that we're that we've been doing in Ithaca, for instance, is, is it, for me a, a supreme example of that. So when I'm calling for a third uh, reconstruction, I am first following the work of black women, which is what we should all be doing. And second, um, suggesting that there are proactive structures that need to be put into place to set up the conditions for full participation in the idea of America, if we imagine that that's a thing that could ever be possible and desirable. I think for many of us um, on January 6th, uh, let's just start there, who, um, who watched the Confederate flag being marched through the Capitol, um, Capitol building, um, I think many of us thought that you know, maybe if there had been something like truth and reconciliation in 18, 1865, in 1964, you know, that, that maybe this could have been, you know. So Matt, I, I think that it might have been the Wi-Fi on your end, but you froze for me. What I heard was, if we'd been honest, maybe we wouldn't been in this. Is that, is that a fair? That's that's a that's quite boiled down, but yes, I mean, I, okay. was, asking about, I was asking asking about the the kind of psychic processes of truth and reconciliation, and 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 what that does for society versus the kinds of denial that we've actually lived with for a century and more. Yeah, and so there's not good research from a psychological perspective on transitional justice or truth and reconciliation. Um, there is political science and sociological research that suggests there are better and worse ways to do it. Um, but nothing like a good way has, ha, has been uh, demonstrated so far. Um, but I would say to that, I'm, I'm in favor of, it. in fact, I, I think that part of the reason why Brian Stevenson is, is a hero to me is because the, the lies that we and mythologies we tell about ourselves as a nation are part of the evil that, can, that can, is perpetuated. But the way I frame it is slightly different. It's not about psychology, um, except in as much as it's about, it's about behavior. If we think about reconstruction as an unfinished project, on some level, so is a completely dominant white supremacy. It is an ongoing project that's well-funded, it's organized, it also has uh, plausible deniability because white supremacy is a thing that gets assigned um, uh, to low income and otherwise white vulnerable communities, which allows for white communities that are less vulnerable to benefit from while still pointing fingers and, and feeling morally superior. That's also an organized project. And yeah. so those two versions of what this country is actually about, the one that's written down on paper about ideals, right, gender, gender uh, uh, pronouns uh, notwithstanding, and the one that was being lived at the exact same time are two competing ongoing projects. And a reconciliation would require us to look squarely at the, the, the yawning gap between who we say we are and who we've behaved as we are. And that might allow us to disallow either some of the mythologies or some of the behaviors. Right? And so to the degree that there's a psychology there, we're, we're, we're back to Festinger, we're leveraging the prospect that cognitive dissonance can promote um, pro-social behavior. I don't know that that's true, but I sure would like to give it a shot because otherwise both projects go on ebbing and flowing with one project being ascendant and dominant, but not complete. And the other project limping along. And that, that other project that limps along, that's the one that allows me full humanity. So I, I'd rather have a fuller accounting where that one gets to be center stage. Right, right. I'm really glad you said what you did about Trumpism because I think that, that it is a myth and it's a really powerful one and it frames much of the public discussion about what, what white nationalism means in this country. Um, I mean, it's, it's a broad enough phenomenon that it does, it takes in a lot of people. And there's, um, I think it's the useful formulation that there's, there's the kind of extraordinary white nationalism of January 6th or Charlottesville, but that's rooted in the kind of everyday ordinary white nationalism that is you know, naturalization law and property law and housing law and discrimination. I mean, there's just like, there is a kind of ordinary quotidian white nationalism that, that we live with. But your point about um, who gets pointed to as the white nationalist is really significant. I, we have a colleague, who teaches at Lehigh in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and he does a lot of community work there. And he said, you know, it's not, it's not the old white 
union people who are who are voting for Trump. It's like you have to go further out in the suburbs to and 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 go pretty much higher up on the economic ladder to to find the Trump voters in in Lehigh County. And I think that that's just a really important truth in our in our public life that has just not it hasn't gotten the traction that it really needs because um, the the white working class scapegoat is um, is just ever present in our in our discussion. I mean, and this is part of the lie that that psychology has abetted for a long time. This idea that the true evil in all of this is the contaminated hearts and minds of white people which makes the project of remedying it a project of salvation for white people, as opposed to a project of uh, sort of restitution um, and, justice, justice. And, and reparations, right? Like, yeah. and, and, and justice on the way to freedom. This is another, I, I, I don't know how long and how deep we're gonna go into each piece of this, but we talk about justice in this moment. And I want everybody to remember when we talk about justice, two things. One, there's no such thing as justice for a dead body. There's only accountability. Right? Justice is that that body not being on the ground. Right? But the other piece is that justice is making something right that wasn't. Right? Freedom is not having to worry about that. Freedom would be liberation from the worst of the past without skipping the steps of accountability and reckoning with it. So at, at, like in this moment when, I mean, this last year, if it hasn't changed you, I don't, I don't know what life you were having before. Um, one of the things that's really changed about the way that I do my work is we t I talk about justice in my work a great deal, um, but I want us and I want my team, the people I work with, to be thinking about freedom. What would it take for vulnerable communities not to spend so much of their lives obsessed with working towards trying to, to resist the lure of making right what had already been done wrong to them and just living because that weight is especially in this context where you said we're at the library but i mean that's not quite right because you're at home and so am i um as is everybody else maybe there's a couple people in the library in which case get out of there i don't think you're supposed to be there um uh, the idea of, of freedom and not just justice I, I want that to be part of of the way that we talk about right now yeah. Can you also say a little bit, I mean, I think that, um, I don't know if you've seen Heather McGee's new book, The Sum of Us, but it's a really powerful argument about the kind of zero-sum game that is that structures our racial discourse in this country to the extent that, that um, well, to boil it down, white, white people feel that people of color can't get justice without it being some kind of loss on their part to the point that they're willing to defend their own whiteness at the expense of real gains. And, and her, her, um, her metaphor is the draining of the public pool. Rather than, rather than desegregate when the orders come down, white people would rather drain the pool and let no one swim rather yeah. than keep it open and, and to have to swim with black people. Um, where does that kind of zero sum thinking and that kind of the, the deficit in white imagination, like where does that fit in the way you're thinking about these broad social questions? So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a true thing. I mean, and Heather is a, we're lucky to have her working in the way that she is and, and with the kind of energy she does. Um, you know, I'd also point to uh, Jonathan Metzl's Dying of Whiteness, which makes a, a similar point, and much of Jen Richardson's um, research yeah. showing this, and, and even before some of that, um, Brian Lowry's research, as it was a social psychologist at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, um, looking at, I would rather hurt everybody and maintain a disparity than have everybody get more and become equal. Right. Um, so it's been a, a feature of the psychological life of white folks in the United States for some time. Um, and I'm glad that it's getting a kind of, of light shown on it right now. I wonder the degree to which that matters as much outside of the political elite class. And here's what I mean. Um, that narrative of your losing out is is proximal to lots of folks um, who feel like you know, this next million is only going to keep me barely keeping track of the Joneses, as well as this next dollar coming in is going to keep, you know, the dog fed, you know, where the kids get, get, get new clothes from it. So everybody can be made to feel in a capitalist system as if they're barely keeping up, right? And so we should, we should name capitalism as an, as an ill and an evil in that way, just, uh, from the jump uh, to manage that. But 
when, when we do our, our, our interviews and when we do our surveys, that kind of zero sum thinking, it comes up in relationship to, I heard it on, so-and-so says. It's not part of the lived reality because there's another piece uh, of this, which I'll, I'll do this by telling the story. So we were um, in a, a, a less urban area where CP, my, my center of police Anthony works. And uh, we were talking with folks um, uh, around police violence um, with black folks in, in, a, in a rural area. And as we're driving, I decided we're gonna take a stop. I got black and brown folks with me who are like, I do not wanna stop here. This is not a comfortable place. We are out of the black rural area. We are in the white rural area. Um, we're not used to the South. Could we please keep going? I was like, I actually think it's a good idea. So we stopped um, and uh, said, you know, we have an idea about where we're going, but I, I, I doesn't, we don't, didn't see anything in terms of food past here. Do you guys have some suggestions? And the folks in the car are in the car, like being afraid. Young, young man and older woman who I was speaking to come out to the car. They roll the window down. They say, so we saw you go, guys go past and then come back out. Are you guys like from, from a university? Are you, are you guys lost? Like, what, tell us a little bit. So send a little bit about what we did. It's like, you know what? Need more people talking to law enforcement and the blacks who get, who get real treated real bad. Um, and so we're real glad you're doing that work. You know, they got Trump signs on the lawn. <laughs> These are not our people. And they said, and you know what? Best pie up here, you're not gonna find you, like it's between two trees and it looks like it's not a road, but go that route, right? You'll see a bunch of bikers parked up there. You get good food, they'll treat you real nice. Tell them we sent you. This notion of we take care of people because that's what good people do. We resist um, attempts to influence us, but part of our character is our ability to be noble with each other that exists in spaces that are otherwise racially hostile. And when they're not talking about race, these, the languages that we use and the lens we use is not part of their, it's part of their everyday life, but not their every moment life. So when I, when I say, I wonder how central it is, there's a political class that, that benefits from those sorts of articulations. And there's, there are communities that are receptive to it. But I wonder the degree to which if we starved our body politic of those toxic messages, a lot of it wouldn't bleed out real early. Because even, you know, this is back when I had locks and hair and I got dark skin folks with me, there are places where it would otherwise seem uncomfortable to be, where when we're able to signal humanity that is not so super racialized, there, there is a neighborliness there. And I'm not trying to to diminish, I realize I've, I've taken a turn into that that dark road, but I'm not trying to diminish. Nobody's going to mistake you for a Pollyanna, no. right? Not, like, they, like there's, there's no way that I'm trying to say that those strains of white supremacy aren't terrifying, um, and that if I shared um, my my compatriots' uh, fears, um, if I wasn't confident that I wasn't putting their lives at risk, I wouldn't stop. There are places where I feel that way and I don't stop, um, but but there is a degree to which the sort of more arch versions of white supremacy are most useful to an elite class of folks being fed to a vulnerable uh, class of folks. Right. And I, I, I hope that, that part is, that becomes part of our analysis so that, because I, I just feel like that's, that's more, that's a more useful way of framing it. Yeah. And well, and it's become more and more pronounced. I mean, there's a whole media universe that is uh, just based absolutely on that. Like they do nothing else 24 seven, but stoke that. Um, that's a whole different dimension of the problem, but I, I, I get what you're saying. It's, it's really important to, to remind ourselves of that. Um, I want to open it up. Um, anyone who has a question, I know there's some really wonderful thinkers on the line who I know, and I'm sure there are many wonderful thinkers on the line who I don't know. Um, so feel free, please, to um, post questions in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will field them as they come. Um, but while we're waiting for those to come in, can you just say a little bit about um, kind of the, the political strategist in you? Um, there are a thousand places to intervene. I mean, that's the nature of the, the problem that we're living with. Um, how do you think about, um, in, I guess in practical terms, not theoretical terms, um, not even grand terms, but just in kind of practical terms, how do you think about 
our way to a better place? Like, what are the interventions that you that you want to make or that you propose? So, I mean, I got a chance to think about that a lot as as we were moving to the election and then through the transition. Um, and two things came out to me as central. The first is I don't think we're ready to do all the things I would want to do. Right? I don't think that we're ready to to do reparation seriously. Um, and I don't mean I don't think we're ready like emotionally. Um, I mean I don't think we have the infrastructure to do the political lift. But also, really, this is these are the sins of capitalism. Like this is money. If you think about the universal basic income experiment that just got published out of Stockton, it's like you give people money and they cost the community less money, right? Like a basic universal basic income raised, I think it was by like 50% on the number of folks who had full-time stable employment with a living wage. It's like, because our safety net sucks and it doesn't suck because we, we don't have the right uh, sort of uh, job reskilling and all the stuff where it just, it takes a bunch of energy to figure out if you're eligible and to maintain all, just give the people the money. Those are the two things. So, so when, I, when I was making suggestions um, to, to incoming administrations and, and office holders, the thing I said was, if we're not ready to do it now, set up the infrastructure so we're ready to do it next. And that means uh, an honest account, it means more historians, bluntly, an honest accounting of how we've been screwing over communities um, uh, and what we would owe if we ever decide to pay, decided to pay. I think that's kind of the thing. Um, and that's not squarely a public safety policing thing, but I tell you what, if folks had the money to solve their own problems, they wouldn't be calling 911 so much. Great. So if that's the thing to do next, you knew this was coming, what's the thing to do first? So, I am partial, I am, I am biased to nerdy solutions. Um, and so what I have told folks to do right now is make accountability and that historical reckoning a requirement for right now. So if you are running, let's say a university, um, it'd be a good idea to have an accounting for all the ways in which the university had benefited from let's say chattel slavery, um, had, uh, had invested money in let's say, you know, uh, uh, apartheid era South Africa um, uh, in uh, systems that exploit uh, child labor, both locally and uh, 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 internationally, all the ways in which the things that we know are wrong have benefited you. You should know about that um, and you should make that public. There should be an accounting. And if not um, a, a full remuneration, there should be an apology and investment in resources um, to make sure that those issues from which you have benefited get better, right? The ways in which we want to hold people accountable for their terrible behavior in terms of, of, of gender violence or, or inappropriate um, uh, speech around Me Too, those are people. People are nothing compared to the size of institutions. But we don't have a language to do that for institutions. So institutions should begin to do that and shame the institutions that don't. That's the right now to set up for what's next. Um, well, since questions aren't rolling in, which surprises me because I know a lot of the people on this line and I know they have a lot to say, but since they aren't speaking up, let's talk about Yale and New Haven for a minute. Um, this is where I ended up in this place with our conversation last week with Dave Rodiger about um, the, the kind of paradoxical position of the university as this kind of insanely idealistic project that I think at some level we all still want to believe in and yet as also one of the worst citizens on the local scene um, how do you how do you think about the modern university and um, I guess either as, as as both impediment to needed progress but also as possibly um, a good actor towards the kinds of progress that, that we need. How do you think about the modern university as an inhabitant of one? So, I mean, I think the first thing is a sense of what community wellness and community safety would look like. Um, if there's not a formal articulation of that, then nobody's serious. Um, I, I think about this in the same way I think about diversity hiring at most universities is that university, if you, if you ask universities to talk about their commitment to diversity, they, they now will have the number of black and brown folks they've hired, right? The number of, um, <clears throat> and I think there's, there's a couple of questions in the actual Q&A as opposed to the chat. 
Um, but uh, they'll, have, they'll have those numbers, the number of folks who left, but they'll say, we are committed to diversity um, because here are our values. We're like, that is fantastic. Um, what metrics are you trying to hit? And they'll say, we are committed to our diversity because those are our values. And you say, great. Um, so you guys have a capital campaign going on. How do we show you, how do you show your commitment to that? They say, oh, we have to raise this amount of money in the first quarter because we're leveraging that money in order to have an incredibly complex plan that has very specific metrics attached to it because that's how organizations often function. For a university to be a good public partner, they need to have metrics. They need to have said, this is what we mean by community safety and community wellness. And here, here's the impact we have on that and the ways in which we're trying to make that get better. But most universities have not even considered how to define community wellness. So they can't quantify, much less just speak intelligently from anecdote about how the university affects the local community mm -hmm. um, and therefore can't con construct a plan that remotely relates to what local folks would say, this is what you do to make it better. And I, I think Yale, bluntly, I, mean, I, I just showed up here. I hope I'm not pissing anybody off too terribly much, but they gave me tenure when I showed up. So here we go. Yale's probably no better. If anything, it maybe is a little bit worse because there's so much money. And yet none of it goes to the community in, in, in large portion, right? If you piss them off, your day is not wasted. That's how I look at it. <laughs> um, Questions. Okay, this is great. Questions are starting to come in and, and they're not going to be in any particular order, but they seem like really great questions. So I'm just going to read them out to you. So one, um, the Supreme Court destroyed the first reconstruction, and I appreciate that formulation. Reconstruction did not fail. It was crushed. Fair. Uh, it stopped progress in the 1890s. It caused great harm in 2013, second reconstruction. How can we expect progress with the current court, which may be in ascendancy for years? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's in part the same question I feel like, um, why on earth would we expect or, or, even, or allow ourselves to hope for something better in this post-George Floyd moment when Ferguson got us nothing, when Rodney King and, and the subsequent trial got us the 94 crime bill, um, and when the assassination of King got us Nixon? Like, why on earth do we imagine it would get better? And I honestly feel like the, the reason why you can't have hope is because we have free will. I mean, nothing more lofty or less than that, because we can insist on different. Portland protested for 100 plus straight days and still hasn't gotten all the things that they're, that they're looking for, but we can insist. And I guarantee that if folks take to the streets, um, the, the Biden administration will need to do something different, mm. masked up or otherwise. Now, I'm not saying that I am particularly optimistic that that's gonna be the path that we take. I'm calling for a, a, a sort of wiser version of what we've had in the past two reconstructions, where quite right, the courts were instrumental in creating obstacles that became the killer of momentum. Um, so if we're gonna do it, we gotta have people who've got a plan for how the courts are gonna, are gonna be either circumvented or gonna be packed with folks who are ready to make that happen. Um, another question. I'm curious how Professor Goff considers the role of family in the family in these issues. There's been wonderful discussion about institutions and workplaces, but I feel like a lot of the work of white supremacy is obscured by rhetoric around family, interge intergenerational wealth, school segregation, et cetera. How do you think about the family in all of this? So I'm not sure that I fully understand the question, whether it's saying that the, these, these talking about intergenerational wealth and school segregation are sort of code for um, a family politic, um, or if it's language around family that's sort of masking our conversation about intergenerational wealth uh, and school segregation. But I'll, I'll say this, I think we know now in a way that we've never known in, in US history, I think in human history, that family structure is not the thing. Right, that it, it doesn't need to look some type of way for the people, the adults within that family to be successful um, and to flourish, and much less for the children to manage that. Resources are the thing. If we're going to build off capitalism, you got to give people enough money that they feel comfortable taking risks, including the risk to learn something new. I can't tell you the number of times where I've got students who have come to my office or office hours now over Zoom um, who've talked about, you know, like, I just want to do okay. I just want to get my grades. My family is counting on me to go and take this wonderful opportunity to go make, make some money. If they had the money, they'd be able to do different things. 
Um, so that's that's a big part of the way that I think about uh, family is that we don't need to focus on its structures um, so much as we need to, to focus on the structures that have influence over the people in them. And I, I read that against sort of the, the historical dogma of we need to have a nuclear family that is strong in order for particularly black folks and, and other vulnerable folks, uh, but mostly black folks to be able to achieve. It's like, we know, we know that's not true. Right. Great. Um, I fear this is gonna have to be the last question. Um, this is a more specific one, but I wanna honor it because it's, it's from an aspiring social scientist. And I wanna, I wanna think that a lot of aspiring social scientists will listen to, to, will take your example and listen to you and learn from you. Um, so this is a very practical question. How did you overcome networks of positivist scholars in psychology to promote and publish your work? And second, um, if you can please share your advice to scholars who in, whose interests are in the intersection of STEM fields and history with respect to their target audience. Particularly, do you think it more effective to direct revisionist science scholarship to humanities or STEM circles? Um, uh, so, so to the individual who, who sent that note, uh, my office hours are Thursdays um, between one and three, sign up. We get a couple of 15 minute slots and, and we, we will dig deep. Um, but for the broader audience, um, it's a really, the first part is just hard. Um, when I was, when I moved to UCLA in 2008, um, it was to replace their black social psychologist. You need one. And so that theirs had left, so they needed another one. And I was the guy with the best citation index um, that made some sense, who they could get. Um, and as, and, and my trajectory there felt like the trajectory of the field. They loved the idea. And then there is the actual work and the work is scary. If the work suggests that the methods are actually not the whole deal and that subject matter expertise matters, mm. if using black people as sort of a, a casual manipulation and experiment without understanding blackness and the history of that is a problem, well, hold up, how much more, this is hard enough as it is. Now I gotta be a good person about it. Um, so the idea that everything can be measured um, and that that's the appropriate place to start, um, it's deep, the physics energy is deep. But more than that, I would say the methodological sloth, not just in psychology, but in most of the quantitative social sciences is so profound because the, the pressures to publish, just the pressures for numbers are grotesque. I don't know what the right solve is because most of the folks who thought like me coming up with me are not with me anymore in the field. Like they, they don't survive and they didn't survive or, or they're, they're massively underplaced compared to their intellectual capacity. So I don't have a happy story about that. I've managed to just kind of rare rabbit my way through a bunch of, <laughs> of, of arrows and bullets um, in, a, in a most unlikely path. But I will say, psychologically speaking, not as in terms of the field, but for myself, I didn't, I didn't go in thinking that tenure was the goal. And so when it became scary that some people who just not, they didn't worry about the numbers or the grants or anything, they just didn't like the work, that they were going to come for me. I was like, well, this wasn't the point. I wanted to actually understand the answer to the question. And it felt like the people who I take seriously thought the questions I was asking and the way I was answering them, that mattered. And if so, I had a community that could give me positive reinforcement on you're not lost yet. And that allowed for me to continue to push through. And then once you have tenure, of course, everybody's like, well, of course, right? Of course, like, I, I, of course I wanted that for you. Um, and I, I think that's kind of the way is that they love the idea, they hate the reality, and then they will absolutely laud the success once there's no more that they can do about it. And for all of my colleagues in the quantitative disciplines, that's exactly what I see. I won't name names because it's not my, my business to tell them to tell their stories, but I know almost no one for whom that has not been the case from the most esteemed to the folks who just made it and made it pass through tenure. So for the, my young new colleague who's thinking through that, to your the second part of your question, is part of the same of the first. If you're in a STEM field and you're not publishing in the STEM field, you cannot be accepted by the field. You cannot get tenure as a sociologist publishing in history, not alone. Same thing for political science, 
Um, uh, same thing for psychology. In these, these increasingly exclusively quantitative fields, you, you can't make it through if you're talking about them. And the folks who talk about a field who are not in the field do not get taken seriously and they don't have a lever to make the change. And it is a violent place, not just in psychology, but all of the social sciences. And if you make it to the other side, then you will have the ability to just say exactly what you think. So my suggestion is don't wait till then because it will eat you up too much um, to, to say, I will, I will play the game until post-tenure. Do it now. And I, my hope is that there will be enough folks in whatever cohort you're coming up in that you guys will have the ability to, to huddle together and, and enough of you make it through to the other side that it's at least a little bit better for the next folks to come. Phil Goff, thank you so much. Um, just so grateful for the work that you're doing out in the world and grateful for your taking your time to, to come talk to us tonight. I know that you could have been talking to Joy Reid or Chris Hayes tonight, but you're here talking with us at the New Haven Free Public Library, which is a great thing to do. So thank you for that. Um, really appreciate it. And um, everyone else, thank you for being here. It's great to see you all here. We look forward to the brick and mortar world where we can all be together. Uh, we do what we can in the meantime. Wash your hands, wear a mask, be careful out there. Don't let your guard down, take care of yourselves. Get the vaccine. Um, and I hope to see you on March 30th for the discussion of the Winchester Gun Factory with Ellie Hugh Rubin, Joan Kavanaugh, and Dorothy Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us. Good night, everyone. And thanks again, Phil. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Matthew Fry Jacobson, from my bookshelf to real life. There we go. I feel the same way.